Road. All right, a little bit about the foundation. Uh, Pro Swaliga was established uh, and duly registered under the laws of Country St. Martin in July of 2020. As a matter of fact, uh, in about three weeks or so, we'll be celebrating our second anniversary. Our statutory objective is the completion of the decolonization of St. Martin and its sister islands. Um, I'm going to borrow a quote here from Judge Sebutinde of the International Court of Justice, who hails from Uganda, and she says, from its inception, the United Nations has played a unique, continuous, and undeniable role in supporting non-self-governing co um, countries and peoples to break the yoke of colonial bondage and domination through a number of avenues. When the United Nations was established in 1945, 750 million people, or almost one-third of the world's population, were under colonial domination. Today, as a result of efforts of the United Nations, Fewer than two million people live in non-self-governing territories. She goes on to expound that since 1945, more than 80 former colonies and trust territories have attained self-determination through independence or free association with an independent state. The question before us today is simply, are we part of the fewer than two million people living in a non-self-governing territory that Judge Sebutinde so eloquently alluded to? We go now to 1946. In 1946, you will see that there was Resolution 66-1. Under said resolution, uh, it was basically a list of non-self-governing territories. It is on this very UN resolution where you can see the former Netherlands Antilles listed under Curaçao. Uh, Curaçao there is listed basically as Curaçao and her dependencies, uh, which would include Aruba, Bonaire, Ceiba, St. Testatius, and St. Martin. What we intend to do today is use 100% UN documentation today. So there will be no speculation, emotional posturing. Every single document we're using today comes from the UN Digital Library of 1955, just to make that clear. Um, the only way to get removed from this list is um, the standard UN practice to get removed from this list is either through independence or the UN having declared three things that you have a full measure of self-government, a right to self-determination has been achieved, and that Chapter 11 of the UN Charter no longer applies. We forward now to 1953. In 1953, we had two specific uh, resolutions that were mentioned in our resolution. The first one at the top is Resolution 742-8, okay? Um, we would like to present to you two key UN resolutions, where it was 742-8 and 747-8, which were both passed on the same day in 1953. If you notice the dates, November 27, 1953. Bear in mind, this is one year before the fabrication of the Kingdom Charter. The UN Resolution 742-8 lists the factors which should be taken into account when deciding whether a territory is or is not uh, or excuse me, uh, whether a territory uh, is or is not a territory whose people has not yet attained a full measure of self-governance. This resolution is very important as it is mentioned in our resolution 945X and will be discussed later during this presentation. First, we will discuss resolution 747-8. Bear in mind, this is 1953. In 1953, you can't really see it too clearly there. But um, the UN had a resolution which states the following, which is 747-8. Uh, Bear in mind the date, 1953. It states, the United Nations via resolution 747-8 expressed to the Dutch state its confidence that as a result of the negotiations with the former Netherlands Antilles, a new status will be attained by the Netherlands Antilles representing a full measure of self-government the, in the fulfillment of the objectives of, set forth in Chapter 11 of the UN Charter. So a year before the Kingdom Charter was even produced, the UN passed a resolution specifically to the Netherlands instructing them to come up with an argument, to come up with a treaty that would guarantee us with the full measure of self-governance in 1953. As we are well aware, excuse me, Bear with me one second here, guys. Thank you, MPs. 
As we are all fully aware, the Dutch state put together the Restrictive Kingdom Charter in 1954 and returned to the United Nations in 1955. The question now arises, do we have a full measure of self-government that the UN prescribed in 1953? We would venture to say that the vast majority of us in this room would unequivocally say no. If that is the case, then it stands to reason that the Kingdom Charter is not only in contravention to Article 73, but also in contravention to our, our Resolution 747-8 of 1953. Proswaliga has published numerous articles regarding Article 44, 50, 51, as well as the institution of the governor. What reservations did the United Nations have regarding the Kingdom Charter in 1955? At the 521st meeting of the General Assembly, page 289, which we've emailed to all the members here that are present, the Iraqi delegation wondered how Article 44 of the Kingdom Charter could be reconciled with the full internal autonomy that the former Netherlands Antilles was supposed to enjoy. Again, this is original documentation from the uh, UN Digital Library of 1955. Forwarding on. At the 524th meeting of the General Assembly, Page 323, the Egyptian and Indonesian delegations felt that Article 44 gave the impression that there was no equal partnership in the new relations between the Dutch state and the former Netherlands Antilles. I'm going to just keep it moving here so that way we can uh, uh, try to get to the crux of the matter here as quickly as possible. Okay. At the 524th meeting, page 311, the Ecuadorian delegation affirmed that Article 50 was even more restrictive. They went on to say, in fact, they declared that the legislative and administrative autonomy that the former Netherlands Antilles has been, had was less than enjoyed by a municipal government in many Latin American states. Okay? And what was said about Article 51? At the 524th meeting on page 308, the Soviet Union delegation, or the Russian delegation as it's known today, noted that under Article 51, the Kingdom Charter of the Kingdom Charter, the Netherlands had the right to dissolve any organ which did not adequately perform its duties in accordance with the Kingdom Charter. They went on to state that in any self-governing territory, that function would be vested in the territorial parliament. We repeat. They went on to state that in any self-governing territory, that function would be vested in any territorial parliament. Okay. This is just a brief synopsis of some of the issues that the General Assembly had with the Kingdom Charter. These issues would lead to two amendments being attached to Resolution 945X by the Uruguay and Indian delegations, respectively. Here we're going to deal with the Uruguay Amendment first, um, and then we'll deal with the real meat and potatoes after this, which was the India Amendment. The Uruguay delegation, excuse me, the Uruguay delegation felt that there were many provisions in the Kingdom Charter whereby the Kingdom was given a dominant position and certain constitutional restrictions were imposed on the peoples of the former Netherlands Antilles. The Uruguay delegation added an amendment to Resolution 945X, which states, bearing in mind the competence of the General Assembly to decide whether or not a self-governing territory has attained a full measure of self-governance. In other words, these types of discussions, whenever we have issues with decolonization, do not fall into the hands of the State Secretary. They do not fall into the hands of the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. They do not fall into the hands of the Eerste Kamer, Tweede Kamer. They fall into the hands of the United Nations General Assembly. That it was stated there, and we have to remember that his amendment was adopted. That's the last sentence you see down below. These are not um, emotional posturings. These are legal wranglings that actually took place in 1955. Bear in mind, again, that these are original UN documentations. This is not secondary sources, uh, third sources. These are the primary sources from the UN Digital Library. Why would the Uruguay delegation seek to help, excuse me, let me finish. 
The Uruguay delegation motivated its amendment by stating it offered the Netherlands Antilles a safeguard, an opportunity of coming to knock at the door of the United Nations should the need arise. Uruguay went on to state that they did not impose, that they did not intend to oppose the Dutch territories, but rather wish to help them. The question now before us is, why would the Uruguay delegation seek to help us? The definitive answer is that they saw our political elders were signing on to a kingdom charter that was in clear contravention, in Article 70, clear contravention to Article 73 of the UN Charter. Moving on. Now, most scholars that have come in front of you, or most people that call themselves decolonization experts, they leave this out. This is the fly in the ointment of decolonization known as the India Amendment. If you read the last highlighted sentence below, this is the crux of the issue here that has been skipped by 99.9% .9 of decolonization experts around the world. Again, this is UN original documentation from 1955. This is not he say, she say, this is not emotional posturing. I will read. It was the aforementioned issues with Article 44, 50, and 51 regarding the Kingdom Charter that the India delegation sought to attach an amendment to Resolution 945X. India's delegation motivated their amendment by stating the decisions taken by the UN related only to subparagraph E of Article 73. Subparagraphs A through D remained in force and could be invoked by the General Assembly at any time. There it is. With all due respect to Professor Hochers and all due respect to the panel that was here before, not a single one of them mentioned this amendment. It is, irres it is intellectually irresponsible to talk the decolonization of our country and leave this out. We're going to go a step further, and we're going to show you the voting records for both amendments in the next slide to show you that this was not just some, con some kind of concocted uh, uh, statement during a delegation meeting. There was a vote on this amendment, and we're going to show you the voting records. Unless there is an amendment anywhere in the UN that retracts this statement, it means that we are not decolonized. Thank you to the India delegation, sir. Moving forward, there you have the voting records right there for the Uruguay Amendment and the India Amendment. Again, these are original UN documentation. There is the vote. Unless you can find a vote anywhere that rescinds this India Amendment or rescinds that Uruguay Amendment, it stands to this day. This is the reason we chose not to come to the first meeting, because we didn't want our information conflated and convoluted in a bunch of emotional posturing. That is why we're here today. That's why we did not join the original meeting, and we politely declined, because we knew this information would not become public. There's the vote. The Uruguay Amendment was passed with 29 votes to 13 with 12 abstentions. The India Amendment was passed with, but it had two parts of their amendment, which we'll discuss later, 27 votes to 7 with 18 abstentions, 14 votes to 3 with 38 abstentions. If you cannot find an amendment moving forward from this, from this date, which I believe was November of 1953, 1955, excuse me, December of 1955, then this stands to this day. We are asking the Dutch state, we're asking the Prime Minister, we've asked the State Secretary, we went to court with this, with this question, and the Dutch state admitted in court there is no resolution, there is no amendment that states that Chapter 11 no longer applies. There cannot be if this India amended, amendment was adopted in 1955. We continue. <clears throat> now, here we can clearly see the voting records, sorry. Here we can clearly see the voting records whereby both amendments were passed and are valid up to this day. Bear in mind that the India Amendment main premise 
was that Article 73A through D remain in force and could be invoked by the General Assembly at any time. As a matter of fact, the meeting regarding Resolution 945X didn't even deal with those other amendments, with other subsections, because it could only deal with, um, with 73E. Here we have a Mr. Bell of the United States of America replying to Yugoslav representative's question that the previous meeting pointed out that the item before the committee was a, was a communication relating to the cessation of the transmission of information under Article 73E of the Charter. The joint draft revolution was designed to deal with that item only. It was not to deal with the entirety of Chapter 73 excuse me, of chapter 11, only with 73E. There it is. Down below, it's highlighted, it says, the Indian amendments seem to be in keeping with, li in, with line of that thought. Because if you have an India amendment that was adopted that states A through D remain in force, you can't come and have a meeting dealing with 73A through E. You can only deal with one of them. It means that the Netherlands was only excused from 73E a through D remain in force. You saw the voting record there before you, and you also have the presentation. You can go through it on your own. Moving on. Um, during the 1950s, the following territories came before the United Nations General Assembly seeking decolonization. Puerto Rico in 1953, Greenland in 1954, the uh, excuse me, the former Netherlands in 1955 and Alaska and Hawaii in 1959. We believe that it is imperative to do a comparative analysis of the UN standard uniform practice whereby three declarations are made, a full measure of self-governance, a right to self-determination, and that Chapter 11 of the UN Charter has never been, uh, is no longer applicable. Before you, you see Puerto Rico's resolution. This was in 1953 on November 27th, you'll notice the right to self-determination has been declared by the UN. You'll notice they clearly identify the status of self-government declared by the UN. And you'll notice down below, chapter 11, of the UN char chapter 11 of the Charter can no longer be applied to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Standard uniform practice in 1953. We forward now to 1954, Greenland. You'll notice again, it says there that uh, a new constitutional status for Greenland, um, of Greenland, the government of, of, of Denmark regards its responsibilities according to Chapter 11 of, of the Charter as terminated. You'll see the second part there, it says um, Greenland have freely exercised their right to self-determination. And at the bottom, you'll see notes with satisfaction the achievement of self-government by the people of Greenland. This is in 53 and 54. We forward now to 59, Alaska and Hawaii. You'll see again, right to self-determination, self-government by the people of Alaska, and chapter 11 of the charter can no longer be applied. That happened in 53, 54, and 59. Why did it not happen in 1955 with our resolution? It's quite simple. In our resolution, you will see that it says, recalling resolution 747-8 of 20, 27th November of 1953. Why was that placed there? That is the resolution that basically reminded the Netherlands that they were supposed to give us a full measure of self-governance in 1953. The Ch Kingdom Charter was not even in existence at the time. They put it in our resolution to remind the Dutch state that your kingdom charter had to comply with resolution 747-8, which it did not, okay? Notice that the UN recalls UN resolution 747-8, which we discussed earlier, whereby the United Nations expressed to the Dutch state its confidence that a result of the negotiations, a new status will be attained by the Netherlands uh, Antilles, representing a full measure of self-governance and a right to self excuse me, and, uh, excuse me, representing a full measure of self-governance in fulfillment of the objectives set forth in Chapter 11 of the UN Charter. 
Moving on. It also, it also mentions in our resolution, resolution 742.8, which we told you earlier in the presentation, lists the factors needed for a territory to be declared decolonized. It says in our resolution, um, here we can see that one of the conditions of set in UN resolution that must be satisfied in order for the UN to declare a territory decolonized. Sorry, that's, that's the wrong part. Sorry about that. So this is the list of factors that need to be uh, achieved in order for us to be decolonized. Why is this in our resolution? Because it was a reminder that these lists were not complied with. If you look at the top, it says, without prejudice to. Okay? The term and legal terms, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here, and we're wrapping this up. Uh, quickly. In legal terminologies, when you're talking about uh, without prejudice to, you're meaning that, that you cannot uh, discount this list of territory, this, excuse me, this resolution still remains in force because the Netherlands did not comply with resolution 742.8, which was in our resolution. Here you will see some of the factors here from seven, Resolution 742. It says here, factors indicative of a free association of a treaty on equal basis with the metropolitan or other country as an integral part of that country or in any other part. The part that the Netherlands failed with miserably with the Kingdom Charter is right here, which is the constitutional considerations. If you read the constitutional considerations, it talks about a basis of equality in changes in the constitutional uh, system. As you are well aware, if we want to amend our constitution, we need to seek approval from the Dutch state. This is in our resolution 742. Since the Kingdom Charter did not comply with, um, with resolution 742, there is no way that the Dutch state, excuse me, that the UN could have made the three declarations in resolution 945. And lastly, we will leave you with the following words from the Dutch state. In February of 2018, uh, the Dutch state submitted a written statement to the International Court of Justice, and in paragraph 2.2 of said statement, the Dutch made the following affirmations. It is submitted that on the basis of these formulations and international treaties and authoritative United Nations delegations, I mean, excuse me, declarations, the right of self-determination of peoples relates to the determination of the political status of a people and the pursuit of its economic, social, and cultural development and future. On the basis of these formulations, it must also be concluded that the decisions on the political status and the economic, social, and cultural development are made by the people itself or its legitimate representatives, not by others. Moreover, such decisions shall be made in full freedom without any outside pressure or interference. I will repeat the last sentence. This was a statement made by the Dutch state to the International Court of Justice in 2018, paragraph 2.2. Moreover, such decisions shall be made in full freedom without any outside pressure or interference. Bear in mind that the International Court of Justice is also known as the World's Court, and it is the court that the UN and independent states refer to when seeking to settle any legal disputes. In closing, <clears throat> Pro Swaliga is not an independence movement. Pro Swaliga is not a political movement. Pro Swaliga is not a racism movement. Those three items fall outside the statutory objectives of the foundation. What we are is a decolonization movement. We thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryson, for that presentation. Uh, committee members, first I would like to say that this is the first time that the foundation has uh, been welcomed to parliament. Right. 
um, there has been a number of different activities at all levels over the last two years as it pertains to decolonization. And so I would like to have this discussion flow as <laughs> seamlessly as possible. And so I would like to ask members to ask one, two questions maximum, and then I can give the floor to Pro Liga to respond. And we, and we handle agenda point in that manner. If there aren't any objections to that, MP uh, Heiliger Martin. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning to everyone listening and viewing online. Good morning to Mr. the two Mr. Bryson, Denise Bryson, Mr. Renate Bryson, and good morning to my colleagues. Uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay, um, if it's okay with you, I would like to respond, if possible, to MP Westcott's uh, letter that she sent out in December. I don't remember, I don't recall all of the questions that she, she mentioned, um, not by heart, but for the most, I can answer a few of them, and if it's not clear, maybe through proceeding, I can put it in writing to her. So for the most, I would like to um, at least mention, and Mr. Denicia Bryson, you can confirm if that's accurate, um, through you, Madam Chair. Mr. Denicia Bryson, at that time, when he was sending the, the letters, was not acting on behalf of Parliament. It was on his own initiative. And then the fact that Parliament endorsed um, endorsed uh, the Pro Liga had nothing to do with his advisory role then. And lastly, all the other questions, most of them that she asked were no, no, and no. Um, uh, we did not financially support the Pro Liga. Um, but what I can do then for the most is maybe um, have it in, in writing to, to, to MP Sarah Westcott-Williams so for more clarity and so that at least that letter can be responded accordingly. But for the most, uh, Madam Chair, I hope it is clear. Um, Pro Swaliga, there's, there's no ties between uh, Pro Swaliga, there's no ties between the party, and there's no ties between Parliament in general. Every, all three entities are on their own accord. So with that, Madam Chair, I would like to know if it's okay that I send the rest in writing or if, if this is clear enough. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Halligan Martin, MP Westcott Williams. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. I thank the Chair Lady of Parliament for, um, for her responses, and I look forward to receiving the official response to my letter. And just for the Chair Lady's um, recollection, that's incoming document 262 of the year 2021 and dated the 29th of December 2020. Madam Chair Lady, if what I hear right now um, regarding my questions about the relationship, the Parliament of St. Martin and the Pro Sua Liga Foundation, um, I would leave the questions that what, what now with respect to the statement that I read from our motion of November 5th, 2020, and I want to repeat that, Madam Chair Lady, because it's the crux, really. The Parliament of St. Martin, in that motion of November 5th, 2020, endorsed the initiative and legal actions of Foundation Pro Sua Liga related to the decolonization of the former Netherlands Antilles, as well as the private initiative in Curaçao objective. That's taken from the motion of 2020. So my question would be, if Pro Sua Liga which, and it was stated clearly by Mr. Bryson, the objective of that foundation. No ifs, no buts. So the action still to be undertaken, um, what consequences can this have for parliament that has endorsed generally the initiative and legal actions? Legal actions, whether these actions are against um, the state of the Netherlands against the government of St. Martin, but that's what a motion of this parliament states. So from that perspective, as I listen to the objective, um, the very clear objective of the Pro Sua Liga Foundation, I ask myself, um, what, what else is the, um, the Pro Sua Liga planning to do in the context of their objective? And what does it mean for the Parliament of St. Martin based on the motion? With respect to the motion itself, Madam Chair Lady, that's another agenda point, and I'll leave my comments on that for then. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. 
Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Uh, MP Halliger Martin, you have yes, the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with, uh, with the recent question posed by MP Westcott Williams, I will also take that up in Presidium and respond officially to that so that it is at least in right and black and white so that um, it can also be clear moving forward. Yes? Thank you, uh, MP Helga Martin. Um, yes. In connection with the presentation, or are there any questions by members to Proswaliga? MP Bryson, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning to you. Good morning to my colleague, members of parliament, the Secretary General, those viewing by various forms of media, and of course, a special welcome to the other two Brysons in the building. Somebody was like, this building about to just poof, <laughs> with the energy in here, but uh, if it's one thing I think all of us have in common is we're extremely passionate and very thorough about the things we believe in, and I think that is what you can get right away from the presentation that we received today. It was extremely thorough, and it was very much uh, backed up by information, which I think is very helpful because um, a lot of times we might get your press releases and so on, um, but we might not have even the, the, the know-how or the access to that level of information where we know exactly where to look. I mean, I've tried it before going into that digital database and I get lost right. because there's thousands and thousands of pages per assembly. That's just for one assembly that might happen in 1953. Right. You're talking thousands of pages because this might have been just a minor section of what was discussed because in 1953 they were discussing oil and with OPEC and they were discussing all kinds of things. But you have a special organization that has an interest in this and was able to zoom in and find text by text, undisputable evidence in my opinion and from my interpretation that something has gone wrong since 1953. I don't think it is that aspect of it should be disputed any longer. Right. Because if we, if, if we just look at what is presented and we look at the behavior we have today, let's compare what we're seeing in these texts to the behavior we get today. Uh, Uruguay, uh, India, uh, US, and everybody is telling Netherlands, hey, this ain't good how you're doing it, you know. You need right. to do it like this, you need to do it like that. And what the Netherlands does, Pfft, well, that's all your business. This is our territory. We're going to deal with it the way we want. Has that behavior changed in the 60, 70 years since? I don't think so. I think it's actually quite similar. Because when the CERD writes something, or when the UN writes something, or special rapporteurs, or whoever else, they just find a way to say, oh, yeah, you know, yes, we know we have institutional racism in, in, in it. You know, you get that acknowledgement. But we're working on it. Will you apologize? Yeah, we know we did damage in Indonesia. But will you apologize for it? No. Yes, we know we were at the forefront of slavery in, in the hundreds of years ago. Yeah, we know, but what are we going to do about it? No, we ain't paying reparations. So what I'm saying is, is that the attitude or the behavior of the state back then is consistent with their behavior today. And generally speaking, countries that have been around for hundreds of years don't just change behavior within a 50-year, 100-year margin. Right. It takes hundreds of years before you see a huge change in the culture and the manner of operating of a state. So that aspect is what gives me even more credence to what I'm reading, that yes, this was done in a kind of a herky-jerky way to say, all right, let me just get satisfied the UN, and we're going to just make it look like we got charter so everybody could just shut up and leave us alone and let us get back to being this small but significant economic power in Europe. I don't know how else to interpret all of this. So I was very happy to see that. Um, what I do want to ask of Pro Swaliga then is the challenge for members of parliament is this. We know this, okay? First of all, and this will come to the motion, the parliament of Simatin can't take nobody to court. We're not a rex person. We, can't, we don't have that legal measure, okay? So I can say why I voted for that motion and specifically for that part. Because you have an entity that is specially equipped and uh, or you say established for exactly the purpose of questioning these issues. But how much time is we going to continue to just send letters and, 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 and have meetings and so on? How many times in Parliament people ask, when, are we, when is someone going to take the Dutch government to court to have the judicial branch weigh in on this? And that is why I supported that, because I endorsed the ability of this foundation to go in the judicial branch and say, all right, 
judges, Europe, you come and tell me what is your interpretation of this. And that's my first question to the Pro Legal. Through this journey of the judicial side and your legal proceedings, what have you learned? What critical information has now come out of those different uh, judgments and, and all of the different documentations, information that the state has provided in defense of their claim? Again, hundreds, probably thousands of pages of information that I or other members of parliament might not be able to go through, but I'm sure you have. And you can say, here's a few things that as a result of our effort, which you, the parliament, has endorsed, this is the information we can provide to you today. I would like to get that uh, information, first of all. Second of all, in that line of the Parliament of St. Martin, um, what specifically do, does the Pro Swaliga Foundation think the Parliament itself can do to remedy this situation? Um, we have gone, I think, in a much better trajectory lately, something that uh, I am very appreciative of because I'm a very solution-oriented person. Uh, it's one thing to do the investigation and find the facts. It's now another thing to say how we gonna fix it. And is, does the Pro Swadiga believe, because I hear you saying the Kingdom Charter as is or the Kingdom Charter that was presented. So my question is, is a solution or a direction this parliament should go being changing the Kingdom Charter to make it fit the, the, the requirements of the United Nations? Or is it the whole Kingdom Charter needs to go in the garbage and we need a new Kingdom Charter. I'm just using that euphemism to kind of highlight which one are we closer to. Are we closer to a situation where the Parliament can start with is within our legal rights, having those discussions and bringing proposals for changing the Kingdom Charter? Or is it that the entire Kingdom Charter got to go and we need a whole new other system to manage our self-governance? Those would be my two questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, MP Bryson. I look to Mr. Bryson to yeah. answer the question. Yeah, the those are, those, yeah, those are very those are very good questions. Um, the, the whole it, it depends on your perspective. If you're uh, someone that's uh, uh, like we said before, we're, we're not an independence movement, even though you know uh, that's a discussion for another time. Um, if you're an independista, you would say you want the whole Kingdom Charter uh, dismantled and getting rid of. For the purposes of 2022, the UN told us specifically in 1955 what is wrong with the Kingdom Charter. It's Articles 54, Articles 50, 51, and then also, if you want to throw it in, the institution of uh, the governorship that represents the Dutch state. So to answer your question, no. Um, if you're seeking to amend the Kingdom Charter to allow Parliament and the government to function optimally, optimally without uh, what they call external interference. We would, we would say, um, based on what the United Nations said, Articles 54, 50, 51 would need to be scrapped. If you scrap those three, you're home free, based on what the United Nations said. Um, the first question you posed, okay. Uh, just, MP? Yeah. just to go back to it, I was explaining mm -hmm. the reasoning why I supported right. and endorsed your movement because right. Parliament can't take to court, but what did you learn from those court proceedings? Correct. We, at first, uh, I remember I'm not, I'm not you know, a legal person here, but obviously haven't been around it for two years. The more you converse with the Dutch state, the more you understand how they think. So two years ago, um, we were on the Article 73 the de decolonization, you know, this, this presentation today is a presentation that we should have given two years ago. We are far beyond that. The more you converse with them, you understand what they will reject and what they will accept. Right now, um, as we were discussing prior to this meeting, <clears throat> we're on a, cool. focusing more on our right to self-determination. Because while they can use the back door for Article 73 and Chapter 11 and say, oh, but you're not on the list, Let's talk about the right to self-determination now, which is a human, fundamental human right. Can you deviate from that? So what we've learned is the more you converse with them, you, you will understand what they're, willing to, what they're willing to legally discuss and what they're re really uh, legally willing to kind of sidestep. And thankfully, um, the more that we've engaged them in the, in the, in the court systems and letters, et cetera, et cetera, um, we have now been able to refine our argument to where now we believe 
Uh, we have two questions posed to the state secretary that we honestly believe there's no derogation from it, and it has to do with our right to self-determination. Basically, in a nutshell, you cannot deviate from a people's right to self-determination. There's no deviation from it. There's no derogation from it. Um, to wrap that up quickly, the whole Harat has ruled in that way. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has ruled in that way. The United Nations, the United Nations Charter says states that, and they're also other legal wranglings. So that's the angle that we're pursuing now. And once we get those questions answered from the State Secretary, we'll be able to present them to you. But um, the biggest thing that we've learned is that the more you converse with them, the more you understand where you need to take your argumentation. Where we were in 2020 with Article 73 and you know decolonization and the Charter and Chapter 11, we're far beyond that anymore because they always found a loophole to get through the back door. Oh, but you're not on the list. But now with these questions that we've refined, there's no way really for them to, um, to navigate rather than to answer these questions because these are, these are questions based on, the, on international law, including the Hokarat. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Do we have any other questions from the floor? MP Pantoflet, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and good, good morning to, again good to- Good morning, sir. Uh, members of Prosalio Foundation, my colleagues of the committee, those that are following and viewing. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, honestly, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work I'm sure that you put into it. And I had the opportunity to read those documents also, right. uh, because um, you know I, uh, you know, when, 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 I, when, I'm, when I'm given information such as this, I take my time to read for myself. I love to read. And again, you, you set up exactly the, the steps uh, in a very understandable manner as to what transpired from 1953 uh, up to, to date. And I think it's important um, that the, the, I believe, I, I think, a uh, letter was sent to the State Secretary for the flooding, it did yeah. April 28, Correct. and um, you got a response as to they're gonna look into it, but did they, they just set a time frame, Madam oh. Chair, to you as to when they're gonna get back to you, or they just said they'll get back to you on it? That's my first question. Um, they have not set a time frame, and the reason they can't set a time frame is that these questions have never been posed to the Dutch state before in 67, let me not say in 67 years. Mm -hmm. Since the inception of the Kingdom Charter, no one has asked these questions regarding the right to self-determination. And what we've done is, um, we just don't stay in-house, obviously, uh, Mr. Denisio Bryson has lots of friends in the legal field, internationally, local, um, Curacao, Aruba, et cetera. And we pose these questions to them, and they have all in accordance said that these questions are gonna be very tough for the Dutch state to answer because like we stated before, there is legal precedence from the whole Rat. Now you can dance around the Rat van Stata if you want, deviate from their opinions if you want. But when you're talking about the whole Rat, that's a different ball game. So we have legal precedence set by the whole Rat. We have legal precedent set by the um, International Court of Justice. We have legal precedent sent by something called the Vienna Convention of Treaties. Now what we're saying is, how are they going to now maneuver around their own hoharat? This is, this, the question basically boils down to this. Can you deviate from your own hoharat who has basically stated the right to self-determination? There's no deviation from it. That's the box that we have them in right now. So we don't expect to get an answer next week or the week after, that's why we said before the meeting, we'll probably have an answer when Parliament reconvenes because you'll probably be in summer session when we do get the answer. But as soon as we do get the answer from the Dutch state, uh, the state secretary will be more than willing to come in and divulge it for you. But they have to be very careful how they answer this question because this question here can lead, can basically open Pandora's box, basically. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. MP, yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bryson, to you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 judicial, the judicial system is always something that is interesting when it comes to the Dutch. Right. When you mentioned the Ukharat, that they have to be very careful how they respond because they cannot, they make sure they don't go against, I believe, the decision. Um, if I'm incorrect, correct me because sometimes I, I don't want to get the two things confused. Um, one of the things that they always, they never wanted to do regards to the issue of laws and um, help me if, I, if, if I'm on the right track, where they, we, was, we are fighting for dispute regulation. And they, they were stating that they don't want their laws to be tested at all in courts. Would this also fall under the same thing, or is something different to you, Madam Chair? 
Okay. Yes. Is well, it it's funny that you mentioned that because it was not even three weeks ago where some immigration policies came before the court of first instance, and the judge was quick to run and use the European Human Rights Treaty to strike down our local immigration policies. So what we say to that is this. If the court of first instance, and it's not the first time they've done it. I'm just quoting one from three weeks ago where I believe it was the Justice Ministry or something like that had yeah. some issues in the court Correct. of first instance with some immigration policies. I don't know the ins and outs of it. But we noted right away that when the judgment came back from the, when the ruling came back, the beslissing came back from the judge, he ran and used a European human rights treaty to, he tested these policies against the European Human Rights Treaty. You are a lawmaking body, and I think uh, MP Rolando Bryson said this just now, you have the same access to do it. If they can test a, a, just a local immigration policy against the European Human Rights Treaty, why would you not be able to test far bigger issues against European Human Rights Treaties or any other ver uh, similar treaties internationally. So I think that argumentation that they're having, whether they're trying to constrain us, whether we can do that or not, I think that goes out the window with the ruling with the first court, in, uh, the court of first instance ruling uh, just three weeks ago regarding that immigration policy. Madam Chair, thank you very much for that. I read that article also and it was very interesting because um, the, the judge even quoted, I think, uh, our constitution, Article 6 in regards to, I think, um, no discrimination, regards religion, sex, and so on. And I'm, uh, my thing is, again, talking about them, they, they conveniently use certain things when they're ready, and then other times they leave it out. So I really hope we could really use that in all perspective. But um, um, thank you very much for, for, the, for, the, for the response, and um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. That's all for now. Thank you, MP Pantoflet. I see MP Westcott Williams would like the floor. MP, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Madam Chair Lady, the, I know we got something from Pro Sualiga yesterday, not a presentation. We received that. And I was trying to, okay, I, okay, I see what it is that we received yesterday. It is the UN decolonization deliberations, et cetera. But I thought it was the questions posed to the State Secretary. But um, it seems not to be so I'm asking since it's only those two questions, right. if those questions can be um, read, provided, or just, I would like to know what we are asking regarding the right to self-determination. Okay. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair Lady. Thank you, MP. Uh, no, we did not send a letter that uh, April 28th to um, to the members of parliament, what we sent was the documentation that we would have today, so you could have it at your own perusal. But we'd be more than happy to um, um, forward the letters to you, um, if you would like, and also um, you would like to expound on the questions. Yeah, it would be done. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> there were basically two questions. The first one was this. If, and we know it is true, the islands have, uh, and write this word down, peremptory right to self-determination. Have you ever heard that word before, peremptory or you skokans? That's a norm in law from which you cannot deviate, neither in times of war, nor in times of peace, nor in an emergency situation can you deviate from a peremptory norm. And the right to self-determination is a peremptory norm. You cannot deviate from it and said, you know what? We have a pandemic and we are going to introduce laws to interfere with your right of self-determination. Which right are we speaking of? There are three peremptory rights that every territory has. The first one is to determine your own economic policy, your own cultural policy, and your own social policy. And then we come to what was shown up on the screen without any outside interference or pressure. Those are peremptory norms. You're not allowed to deviate from them, neither in times of war or peace, nor in terms of emergency, states of emergency. So you cannot say, I have a pandemic, a coho, and I'm going to use that to violate your right to determine your economic policy without any outside pressure or interference. That is what a peremptory norm is. So the questions that you're asking through you, Madam Chair, the question, So the question was this to the, to the, to the, to the Ms. Van Niffelen. 
can COHO be used to violate that right of self-determination? We ask that. The second question is, can the kingdom charter itself interfere with that right to self-determination? And you could realize that those are two very critical questions that has never been posed in the history of the Antilles because they always hold the kingdom charter as sacred, but we discovered that the peremptory right of self-determination is higher than the kingdom charter. So our question to her was, can the Kingdom Charter violate the right to self-determination? Or is our right to self-determination above the Kingdom Charter? Those are two questions. So can you use, the first question was, can there be any way to deviate or to attach or to violate a peremptory norm? And number two, does our right to self-determination prevail above the Kingdom Charter? And we know the answer to those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Do we have any other questions from the floor? MP Bryson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. As I had a follow-up. I said, let me wait until if, in case there were other ones. Coming back to the answer that was given with the three articles in the Kingdom Charter that, are, that need to be changed. Mm -hmm. For the edification of the members of parliament and the public, can you highlight why specifically those articles, how do they invade our, our, our right to self-determination and why they should be removed? Those, the, the three articles in the Kingdom Charter. If you go back to the yeah. debates that we showed you on the screen, the members asked Holland, how can you say you gave these people a full measure of self-government when you have a governor with that amount of authority? You appoint him. You set his regulations. They cannot change anything in his regulations. And the members ask, that is incompatible with a full measure of self-government. So the position of a governor, his very function is incompatible. If you have a full measure of self-government, how could a governor have that authority? That's what the members ask. You can look at you can read it in the debates yourself. The next thing they asked, Article 44. You need prior permission from the, from the kingdom to change your constitution or your legal system. The members asked the same thing. How could people who you're telling us have a full measure of self-government have to come to you for permission to change their legal system or their constitution? Then they move on to two other items, 1551. And there the members really went crazy. How can you tell us, the United Nations, that you have given these people a full measure of self-government when you could impose higher supervision on them? That is utterly incompatible with a full measure of self-government. So those are the four items. A governor is not compatible with a full measure of self-government. Article 44, where restrictions are placed on your right to change your constitution or your legal system and 50 and 51, which gives the Dutch state authority to put you under high supervision. Those are utterly incompatible with a full measure of the governments. And those are the reasons why the United Nations refuse to state those three statements, that you exercise your right to self-determination, that you have achieved a full measure of the government, and that chapter 11 no longer applies because of those four items. Thank you. MB Bryson, you can go ahead. Thank you. Mic check, yeah. <laughs> Too much Bryson stalking, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then now is my turn to, let's say, play devil's advocate, because I fully agree with you. Uh, in principle, a lot of the issues I think we face with the Dutch Kingdom always comes down to that. Uh, we have situations with the governor where ministers can't pass screening or can't be, it's a governor that ultimately decides who can be a minister in this country. That's a problem. You have a national decree that is agreed upon by a council of ministers. The, the, 
the appointed body to manage the country, uh, they then need to send that national degree to the governor and hope and pray that he will agree with what all seven of our appointed ministers agree. So indeed, clearly that's not self-governance. But I'm going to play devil's advocate and say what I've heard others give as a counter argument. Um, as a new country, you're back in 1953, these, you know, hey, these guys need our help. We need to guide them in how to become a country. So what we're going to do, we're going to put a couple articles in there to act as a safeguard to, you know, make sure that you don't get a, a rogue government that comes in and makes maybe irresponsible decisions for the people of that country. Um, for example, when you, it, it's very slick, I'm going to use that term, how the text reads when you translate it in the English form of Article 51. If a body in Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin does not or does not sufficiently provide for what is required to pursuant to the charter, an international regulation, or a kingdom act or order of council, it may, with indication of the legal grounds and motives on which shall determine the manner uh, in which it is provided by an order in the council. The English translation is kind of jumpy, but my, my essence here is, no, but we just do this as a safeguard because, you know, in case something goes wrong, you know, we need to come in and help them and give them higher supervision, you know, because we could help them with their finances and their justice system. That is the devil's advocate approach that you get to this. So how does Pro Swaliga respond to that? <laughs> have you read, have you read the, the minutes of the meetings? The United Nations members did not want to hear any of that kind of stuff. They ripped those arguments to shreds. That is why, because their statement, their point of view was, you are supposed, your obligation is to ensure a full measure self-government. That is your obligation. That was what Resolution 742 of 1953 told them. Yeah. When you come back, whatever status you give them, it must have, it must ensure a full measure self-government in accordance with the objectives of the United Nations. So the members were not having any of that kind of stuff. They were highly skeptical and they were very, very rough on Holland. As a matter of fact, Holland spent eight days in front of the General Assembly. Most countries spent half a morning. Puerto Rico spent half a day. They kept Holland eight days in front of the General Assembly because they were so skeptical and so suspicious of this kingdom charter. Uh. I would like to add to that too. Um, don't forget that, that you know a lot of times, what we like to do a lot of times is also use what the Dutch state has said. So we refer you again to paragraph 2.2, 1.5, 2.4 of the written statement that the Dutch made uh, to the International Court of Justice. Um, and again, a lot of the a lot of the questions that you're asking about providing a safeguard. You know, if you go to 1.5 of the written statement, which we sent to you guys yesterday, um, excuse me, to the MPs, not you guys, MPs, yesterday, it says, according to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the right of self-determination of peoples is not exhausted by a one-off exercise. So the Kingdom Charter signing in 1954, or 101010, 10, 10, but a permanent, continuing, universal, and inalienable right with a peremptory character. These are the words of the Dutch state, yes? And then, of course, we'll go back to uh, paragraph 2.2 of the written statement where the Dutch state says, and this is to the International Court of Justice again, on the basis of these formulations, it must also be concluded that the decisions on the political status and the economic, social, and cultural development are made by the people itself or its legitimate representatives, not by others. Moreover, such decisions shall be made in full freedom without any outside pressure or interference. So the question is, there's a huge disconnect, and I know what you're trying to, uh, uh, to, to you know, play devil, devil's advocate, which is good. Um, there's a huge disconnect between what they recently told the International Court of Justice and what the Kingdom Charter is, is doing. So you can't, for instance, you know, we're here in St. Martin, but you can't, for instance, say these things in 2018, but in 2017, you go and strip state of its democracy. And less than a year later, you're going in front of the International Court of Justice and making these statements. That is a semblance of a senile state because less than 12 months after stripping the stations of their democracy, you go in front of the International Court of Justice in February and you make these statements. 
So we can, we can have all kind of wranglings we want about opinions or whatever, but what we like to do is show me something from the Dutch state where they have said something to a higher order of counsel in the International Court of Justice where these words have been contradicted. And if you can't find that, then these words become words that they have to answer to because, again, remember, these are not words spoken in the Twitter camera or the Airster camera. These were written statements submitted to the International Court of Justice just recently in 2018. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. Thank you. I look to the floor. I don't see any MP pantaflet. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just um, it, it is said that we could look at the articles 50, 50, uh, 54, 50, 51, article 44 to Correct. scrap them if you want to remain within the framework of the King of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, the, these, the, the charter is a kingdom law. And my, 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 my um, concern is that how do we change and do we come with proposals from within the charter itself or do we look at international treaties and try to use them as our support in order to change them because any law has to be changed within the Kingdom Charter. There's a procedure within the Charter itself how these laws have to be changed. And we know exactly the final analysis, who has the final say. As a matter of fact, they even call them at times consensus Kingdom laws, but nowhere in the Charter yes, sir, is what consensus mentioned. Correct. Correct. So how do we approach that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP. Mr. Bryson, would you like to respond? I do not know if you listen to my answer to Sarah Westcott's question. What were the two questions we asked the state secretary? You, 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 you understood the question we asked her? If we have the peremptory right of self-determination, that right supersedes, it's higher than the Kingdom Charter. In other words, Article 44, 50, and 51 cannot intrude on our right to determine our economic, social, or cultural policy without outside pressure interference. That is a higher rule than the Kingdom Charter. It actually puts Kingdom Charter and Article 44 moot. It makes them irrelevant because you cannot interfere with that right to determine your own economic, social, and cultural policy. The Kingdom Charter is of a lower order than a peremptory norm. That is what we asked Van Huffelen. But I think, if, if I can think, I think the, the question is what you're asking, the practicality of making it happen. And I often ask that question as well. Well, firstly, it would, it would have to be whereby the Dutch state is willing to, for lack of a better word, um, um, so see, I mean, recognize the fact that the Kingdom Charter is offside. And unless that happens, I think that's where your question is leading, and that that's, you know, it's, 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 it's historically proven that even when they're seen to be offsides, uh, not much happens. So I would say to you, and I think Dr. Ardoin said it here when, when she was here last for the, um, for the meeting, um, with the, the last meeting you had, um, to seek some sort of mediation, um, international mediation, to get some mediators in. Um, I don't know what process that would be for Parliament or the government, what have you, but you would definitely need to get um, some sort of international mediation because, as, and I know where that, where that question is going, the Dutch are going to dig their heels in because, remember, this is 67 years of being offside. And now all of a sudden, in 2020, you're being told you're offside and you have the legal, um, you have the legal precedence there to show them for the first time in 67 years that they're offside. They're not just going to you know, uh, fold up the tents and go, go away. So I think uh, the answer to your question, I think it would be some sort of international mediation, if possible. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. MP, uh, the microphone. No, not yours. Mm. Uh, MP Wascott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Madam Chair Lady, my late mother used to love to say, um, no, no, she didn't, didn't actually love to say, but she used to look for a way to say, um, God sink it. But she felt that would come across kind of blasphemous. So she would use uh, saying that God sink it, come wrong nevis. So we have, we use that now to say going a very long route 
to get to where you wanted to get. Saying all of that, Madam Chair, Lady, that I have taken note of the foundation's um, statement that now the thrust, the thrust is on the right to self-determination. Madam Chair, Lady, we of this parliament have created a committee um, for decolonization. And you would remember, and you always smile when I bring this up, and I'll continue to bring it up, that I indicated the only way I would support that committee if it was looked at in a broader context, namely one for constitutional affairs. Hence our name today for that committee, and I want to say thank gracious, because otherwise we would have had a committee here for decolonization and we would have had to decide whether we would follow the route of the pro Liga Foundation to change the focus. So Madam Chair Lady, I say all of that to say, um, I, I just the beginning of this month, based on a request by the second chamber, same ones with who we would have to talk or we would have to look for pressure on, um, received a fact sheet from um, some learned gentlemen in this area. And I see our presenters don't necessarily share my word, but that's the way they address themselves. And they address several things that we heard here this morning. Um, it's not my intention to get into the debate on that document right now. However, I do believe that hearing this, what we're hearing this morning, um, like I stated back in 2020, I think we need to be very, very um, we need to be quite aware of where St. Martin wants to, um, to go with our constitutional status. I, I have stated that from day one. That is firstly where we want to go, how we plan to get there, and whether that matter is a priority for the parliament and the people of St. Martin today. And so again, um, we made a, a lot of, we had our round table here, we talk about changes to the charter, got a lot of information, and it behooves us, whether in conclave or otherwise, to decide where we want to go with the political status of this country. Um, my personal opinion is that um, while there are some urgent matters that we should seek redress on within our constitutional makeup right now. There are so many more items and issues that this parliament and the government of St. Martin should um, give all of its focus and priorities. But I say that to thank the, the, the gentlemen, um, both Mr. Bryson's for their insights and presentation. And um, yeah, it has put a, given a somewhat different spin, I believe, to our discussion on decolonization, and I await one, the questions to the state secretary, and of course, the answers of the, of the Dutch government to these questions. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. I think I will always continue to smile whenever <laughs> we are reminded, because I was, I was happy, I'm still happy, that you uh, definitely broadened the scope of, of what the committee was originally meant to be, because indeed, it is more than just our political status, it is our constitution, it is the kingdom in which we are, and um, we are not the only ones at this time looking at the kingdom, looking at, again, what it means to be a citizen in this kingdom, and what needs to change moving forward. It was funny when the, the uh, pop-up from Doshe Koninklijk Relatsies.com popped up that the summit on the Coho has failed. That's, that was the title of it. Summit has failed on Coho. Why? Why is the summit failing on Coho? Why are we continuing to discuss the issues that we face with the Netherlands, whether it's on Coho, and our, at the core of it is our right to self-determination, uh, we are living in interested times. Uh, we did have our own table, and this parliament and those in this committee have said we uh, want to at least work on amending the Kingdom Charter because that is one thing that we all can agree on. And we can see what those changes can mean um, for this country and our people moving forward. I would like to ask P. Um, Madam I was Chair, say sorry, before you. MP Pantoflet. Yes. 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 Um, 
um, my colleague mentioned, yes, there are very important things taking place, and definitely the coho is one of them. And exactly, exactly the coho, where I listened to a presentation uh, between the four uh, um, prime ministers, uh, minister, the three ministers, prime ministers, and the state secretary, and you could tell by the discussion again, it surrounds the coho, and who has the authority to decide what, when, and where. And today, they have not come to a decision because the fact is, as I mentioned previously, you're, you're being told, and she said it last night, she said it yesterday, um, Alexander von Hiffel, the state secretary, you know, uh, is a, we, we're working together as a salmon wedding. king. I don't consider it a salmon wedding. king. Uh, she said we all agree together. Agree together to what? If you agree together, how, would, how come it's not solved as yet? Because why? What you want to implement with conditions and so on, we cannot agree with it. And a matter of fact, again, the coho is a kingdom law. It's a draft law, but the procedures to which it has to go is laid down in the charter. And I understood also that Friday upcoming, they're going to discuss because Aruba agreed, but, uh, but Carousel and Simon are still saying, no, we don't agree to all the conditions. And then she said, yes, that they can still agree because um, of what, uh, what, Caruso, uh, what Aruba agreed to. But St. Martin and um, Curacao have not agreed as yet. So the discussion is still ongoing. So, so there alone we see, Madam Chair, basically because of how the charter is set up, where this kingdom of which came from them, okay, not from us. I like that they give it a Caribbean name, but it's the Dutch. It's not ours, Madam Chair. So yes, the important things which we have to deal with right now, and definitely the core is one of them. If it was up to me personally, Member of Parliament George Pantaflet, I will take the kingdom charter, fold it up, put it in the garbage can, and leave it there. But I don't have the authority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. If there are no other words from the members of Parliament, I would like to give the floor to the Proswaliga Foundation for closing remarks. Do you have a pen? I do. Write this down. Juice Cohen's and Peremptory Norm. Bye. And for those of you that don't uh, speak English, we have a Dutch LLM here, Dwingend Rechten. Write that down. Okay, I would like to thank the I'd like to thank the Proswa Liga Foundation for your attendance here. You have given us a, number, um, a lot of information uh, to do our work. I thank you, and um, I thank the members of Parliament. I would like to now close Agenda Point 1 and adjourn for two minutes before we go on to Agenda Point 2. Agenda Point 1, hereby closed. I hereby adjourn the meeting for two minutes.
Good afternoon, members of the Committee for Constitutional Affairs and Decolonization. I hereby reconvene this meeting and we go over to agenda point two, the furtherance of the motion of November 5th, 2020. On November 5th, 2020, Parliament approved a motion presented by MP Heiliger Martin regarding decolonization, a decolonization committee, and a Kingdom Roundtable Conference. This motion resolves to urge the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to cease and desist from any actions which conflict with its continued obligations under Article 73 of the UN Charter and to invoke the right to directly approach the UN General Assembly. It also resolves to, it resolved to endorse the initiative and legal actions taken by foundations in St. Martin and Curaçao related to the decolonization of the former Netherlands Antilles. It declared any actions by the government of the Netherlands which did not treat the interests of the people of St. Martin or violated obligations of the Netherlands as null and void and resolved to immediately retain local and international legal counsel to assist the parliament and government with ending violations of St. Martin's UN mandated right to a full measure of self-governance and completing the decolonization process. The motion instructed the Council of Ministers to act in accordance with the motion and to urgently initiate dialogue to prepare a Kingdom Roundtable Conference by July 2021 in which all partners would ratify and commit to completion of the decolonization process of the former Netherlands Antilles. It also resolved to establish a permanent committee on, the, on constitutional affairs and decolonization of Parliament of St. Martin. In her email of December 29, 2022, under IS 262, 2020, 2021, MP Sarah Westcott Williams made reference to this motion. I would like to give the floor to MP Sarah Westcott Williams for some introductory remarks on this agenda point. MP Westcott Williams. Thank you once again, Madam Chair Lady, and a good morning. Madam Chair Lady, as the agenda point request, my agenda point request stated, I would like to get into the furtherance of the motion of November 5th, 2020. In other words, the get into, hear about, receive information on the execution of the motion. And very specifically, Madam Chair Lady, you read the resolutions of the motion, several of them. But I would like to focus on the points of the resolution of that motion, points number six, eight, and nine. And I would like to ask whether the instruction to the Council of Ministers, this is number six on the resolution of the motion, to instruct the Council of Ministers to act in accordance with this motion with immediate effect and to urgently initiate dialogue with the legitimate governments within the Kingdom of the Netherlands to prepare a Kingdom Roundtable Conference by July 2021, during which all legitimate democratically elected governments within the Kingdom of the Netherlands will ratify and commit to the complete decolonization of the former Netherlands Antilles in accordance with Article 73 of the UN Charter, relevant UN resolutions, international treaties, and other sources of international law. Madam Chair Lady, um, has this instruction been issued to the government based on the motion? One, if so, what has the government response been? And then I want to go to number eight. Um, to instruct the Chair of Parliament to bring this motion and its underlying documentation to the attention of the legitimate legislative, executive, and judiciary branches within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the United Nations General Assembly, COPAL, CARICOM, as well as having it added to the agenda of the Inter-Parliamentary Kingdom Consultations meeting scheduled for January 21. Um, was that point executed and was any response had from any of these bodies with whom this was shared. And then um, the, for me, the, 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 the gist of it is that the parliament at the time mandated the chair of parliament to communicate with any and all third parties on its behalf where it concerns all matters related to this motion and its execution. 
and I would therefore like to know um, what has the Chair of Parliament done as part of this mandate of the Parliament? What has the Chair of Parliament done in execution of this general mandate given with respect to the matters in this motion? Madam Chair, Lady, these are the questions that I want to follow up on this um, motion of November 5th, 2020, and receive some information as to what is happening behind the scene with respect to this entire matter. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. In response to your questions related to government's actions based on the motion, as chair now, um, I would then have to forward those questions to the government in order to get a response from them uh, officially. Um, it regarded the, yes, so, so asking government to um, contact other bodies, those questions will be sent. I would also now then, uh, to answer the other questions regarding the chair, give the floor to the chair lady, um, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin, to respond to you directly. MP Martin, you have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I would like to maybe um, give a complete update of the motion, this actionable motion that was. Um, was uh, but for the most unanimously supported November 5th, 2020, this has nine resolutions, of which one was only directed to the, the government, and the rest was all for Parliament to uh, execute. The first resolution, I'm not going to read them out completely, but just to highlight what it was. The first resolution uh, urged government in the Netherlands and the, the Netherlands and the Kingdom of the Netherlands to cease and desist from actions which results with its continued obligations under Article 73. Now, with that, Madam Chair, uh, the Dutch House of Representatives has recently just placed Article 73 on the knowledge agenda, and that will be discussed recently from very soon. Um, uh, Pro Swaliga also supported this with the letters mentioned earlier, and um, there has also been an academic fact sheet that has been published with, which concludes and confirms that Article 73 is still applicable. I've also asked a question, I don't know if every, any member of parliament remembered during the time when we were compiling the questions together for the uh, report for COHO, I also asked directly, something similar to um, the, Mr. Bryson's question, is the COHO, the construct of the COHO in, um, in violation of Article 73? We're still waiting on that. So for the most, you can see, um, many things have been um, going on surrounding um, uh, Resolution 1. Resolution 2 was to evoke the right provided by the approved amendment to the UN Resolution 945 to di directly approach the UN General Assembly. Now that, we did not directly approach the UN um, General Assembly. We approached with the, with the um, advice of the Coharis group, we decided to approach the um, special rapporteurs, and that we will discuss further down, I guess, in the um, agenda points. But that also, I can see a check mark there that it has been for the most um, done, that we did invoke the right of UN Resolution 945, but not directly to the General Assembly, that we endorse the initiative of the legal action of Foundation Pro Saliga. Pro Saliga went to court. They got their... Uh, verdict, and that's what we did. We, dis we endorsed the right for them to go to court and seek information. As MP Bryson stated earlier, we are not, um, we, it's not in, within our purview to take government to court, so they did it, and we endorsed that, and we were looking forward to the response from that, because that is what we're also using in our trajectory towards finalizing the decolonization. Then, declares any actions, including proposal, legislation actions and initiatives by government of the Netherlands which do not treat the interests of the people of St. Martin as paramount. I'm not gonna go in complete details there. This I have, that this declaration still stands and is applicable, applicable to and among other things, the current draft COHO law and also the position of the Pro Swaliga. Then the fifth one is to resolve to immediately retain a local, inter um, a local international legal council, which we already also did. Um, that is uh, Peter Coharis, the Coharis group, which was hired at um, 
a heavily discounted rate that I guess we'll discuss, discuss later. So then we go now to six, which is to instruct the Council of Ministers to act in accordance with the motion with immediate effect and, and to have the table roundtable conference of July 2021. Although the deadline was not met, the execution of this decision is directly tied to that of the Van Raak and the De Graaf motions in conjunction with um, each other. The IPCO has decided to ask the four governments of the status for a status update. The latter motion is aimed to amending the Kingdom Charter. And in, meantime, in the meantime, the Prime Minister of Curaçao and MP Mike Ayman of Aruba has also suggested a Kingdom Conference to discuss the constitutional relationship. State Secretary of Bezaka has told the Dutch House of Representatives that she wants to make agreements regarding this process before the summer based on the Dutch coalition agreement. So that is also ongoing and that we are looking at very carefully as well. Uh, number seven, resolution resolves to establish a permanent committee of constitution. Yes, of course, here we are. So that has been done as well. And then you have um, resolution eight, instructs the chair of parliament to bring these motions to its underlying documentation. That was also done I don't know if my, maybe we can give the former chair of parliament some in, maybe some time to elucidate on that, because that's um, one that he did in the past. But um, for the most, I, I remember sending out letters to Kopal and CARICOM, and I don't have all the information, the details with the response or so. And then lastly, to mandate the chair of parliament to communicate with any and all third parties on its behalf where it concerns all matters related to this motion and its execution. That, as we can see, is an ongoing process. Um, they, uh, we have sent letters out to committees. We have uh, met, had other meetings, you know, gathering information regarding the decolonization process. And, and that's still, as, um, as stated, an ongoing process. So I hope that that's clear. Most of it has to do with the letters that were sent out, and those were public, made public, and made and open for members of parliament to see when, whenever we sent anything out. So for the most, and that's, that's, I hope it's clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Halika Martin. MP Peterson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. A good afternoon, well, good morning still, to all of my colleagues and to everybody else tuned in. Madam Chair, sorry, um, I, I reached late, and, but I did have the opportunity to listen to the meeting um, before I reached. And I was, I was a little bit confused as to the setup of the meeting because I was under the impression that the, the foundation that was just here was going to stay for um, the, some of the other agenda points, given that they were also mentioned in, for example, the motion. Um, but um, that um, aside from the case, um, I did get a chance to listen, and of course, the last couple of minutes that I got to catch from the meeting, um, it kind of it kind of makes me laugh. You know, um, it it makes me want to remind the people of St. Martin that we, as the PFP faction, did not vote for the motion. And one of the resolutions in the motion that was very troublesome for us at the time, I remember, was uh, resolution number three which was that the government, um, the parliament endorses the initiative and legal actions of Foundation Pro Soliga related to the decolonization of the former Netherlands Antilles as well as a private initiative in Curaçao with a comparable um, objective. Um, since then, um, we had our doubts about the foundation. Um, me, um, I, as Emma Peterson, in, in no way whatsoever endorsed any actions or opinions brought forward by the Pro Soliga Foundation. Um, I think they lack the basic legal expertise to give any advice on any matter when it comes to our constitution and our kingdom, um, especially based on their behavior today in agenda point one, in which I saw that one of the members of the foundation instructed the chair lady to write down something. Um, I don't know if that's normal uh, parliament procedure, but um, I, for one, um, did not find that to be very respectful, um, but I can only assume that there was a, a poorly executed mic drop. But um, that also um, gives me the assessment professionally to categorize them as a conspiracy theory foundation, you know, that is just desperate for an audience. So maybe that is the reason why are, they are no longer part of the staff of the faction of uh, one of the parties in parliament. 
So um, I do want to make it clear, um, me personally, um, I will not waste my time anymore. Um, this Dutch LLM, um, by the way, the term is Twingetrechtelijk, which did not apply um, in the, the sense that they were um, making it seem just now. But uh, that aside from the case, um, I'm not going to waste my time with the foundation anymore. And um, after the actions today um, regarding the lady, um, I do also hope to not see them on the floor of Parliament again. Aside from that, um, I also want to echo MP Westcott Williams um, in regards to the questions to government, um, you know, um, in execution of the motion, you know, to kind of assess what the actions of government have been, you know, for the last um, one year and a half, I believe. Um, I do believe now that we have had IPCO, um, you know, we've had the COHO pending, and with other constitutional and kingdom affairs pending, um, I think that our actions as a country at this very point should be pretty much pinpointed so that we know exactly where we stand, and hopefully, you know, together choose um, in which direction we want to take it as of now. And I think that will be all for me, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Peterson. I give the floor to MP Gums. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good uh, morning to you, my colleagues, if you're those joining us. Um, Madam Chair, I uh, had actually submitted, not so in, in accordance with the motion, but I had submitted a request to the President of Parliament regarding receiving the correspondence between Koharis and the United Nations Special Rapporteur. Um, as the client of Koharis, as a member of Parliament, um, I do believe that these types of correspondence should be shared with the members so that we actually 100% understand from the horse's mouth, so to speak, uh, what is the communication right now between the special rapporteur and the law firm that parliament, the people, are paying to represent them. Uh, so that's the only real question I have regarding this uh, agenda point. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. Uh, first, I must say, just to respond to MP Peterson, uh, although, yes, this agenda point mentioned Proswa Lega because they were one of the resolutions, uh, the idea was that Proswa Lega come in for the first agenda point, and any questions directly or, or directly aimed at the foundation that they can answer themselves, that they would have been asked in the first uh, agenda point, and if not, then their presence wouldn't be needed any further. Um, MP Gums, I do agree with you, and so I have to ask about the correspondence being shared with everyone. Uh, MP Heilega Martin, would you like the floor? Yes, I was just oh. to, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, um, first uh, the floor to MP Westcott Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. A brief um, point of order, sort of, Madam Chair Lady, because we have the motion, then we have, I mean, my request was um, the agreement with the Koharis Law Group, and then thirdly, the petition. I would want to suggest that whatever questions regarding the two agenda points to follow, they be posed now, because it's all sort of related. So I want to suggest that, and in suggesting that, because for me, um, what is what is important right now is the, um, I concur with the questions of MP, MP Gums. Um, what exactly is the status currently with the Koharis law firm? What exactly? What is the correspondence? I heard the chair lady of parliament um, sort of alluding to Parliament being aware of the outgoing letters, documents, but I'm not sure what that is in reference to. So, um, no, we don't as Parliament receive automatically um, copies of outgoing documents and whatever have you. So very specifically regarding this petition, has the agreement for the petition been signed on behalf of Parliament. You know, so between the law firm and the Parliament, has such been signed? What is the basis, what is the beschicking, the decision of Parliament on the pinning that signature of Parliament? It can be the motion. Because if we're going to sign off with a law group, a foundation, a firm, it's going to have to be a specific decision by parliament. We can't say you have a general motion and based on that, it has been signed off. So what is the, what's the basis for that? Um, Madam Chair, lady, because if something goes wrong with this contract, goes wrong in terms of parties not meeting their obligations, one contesting whatever to the other, 
who represents parliament? Who represents parliament? So if this agreement has been signed, party A to do this, party B to do that. The party B being parliament, parliament is going to pay. And in exchange for payment, certain expectations are made. So if one party or the other does not comply or comply sufficiently with the agreement, who, who is then held responsible? Who is held responsible? So this agreement, was it signed by a representative of parliament? And the only representative who can sign would be, I assume, the chair of parliament. And what's the underlying um, basis for, 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 for that? Um, how long is this agreement to go on? Are we still paying? Payment takes place on the basis of what? What are the outcomes that we expect to have? Especially given the discussion that we're, that we're hearing now and the sort of change of direction a little bit, we're going to kind of shy away from the decolonization a little and we're going to focus on the right to self-determination, whether we have it or not, whether we are exercising it sufficiently or not, et cetera, et cetera. So, Madam Chair, Lady, in essence, with respect to this, um, to the motion, the Chair Lady of Parliament gave a brief outline of where things stand. I get a complete different feeling from the government. Also in responses to questions by members of parliament. I get a complete different view of how the government is looking at this matter. But that's for, that's for another time. That's one thing on that motion. Um, so as I said, the, was the agreement signed by parliament for how long is it, et cetera, et cetera, and what is the underlying decision slash beskicking of parliament supporting such a, which is a, a rarity in its, on its own, um, but what is underlying that? Who, who is held accountable for a contract, for this contract in, in particular? And um, has there been any official further information provided on behalf of Parliament to the Koharis Law Group? Um, there was even an updated petition, which we see a passant. Um, we, were, we, we learned of. So what exactly is the status of the agreement between the Parliament of St. Martin and the Koharis Law Firm at this time? Madam Chair, Lady, I thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Just to clarify with the point of order, what I see now is that basically the last three agenda points have been merged and we are handling all three at this point. If there are no ob objections, then, then, um, then we're good to go. Thank you, MP. I now give the floor to MP Helica Martin. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair Lady. Uh, no, that was a lot of questions. Let me see if I can remember all. Uh, the agreement with... Uh, Harris has ended in December. During that time, the time of 2020, 2021, I think I mentioned here uh, the petition was, the petition was, I think we went in detail on what the details of the petition was. It was sent, it was reinstated in February. Now, all um, the Co-Harris group is busy doing is following up with the Special Rapporteur in the UN Working Group. That's mainly what, what they're doing. So what they were hired to do was to petition the UN, which they petitioned the, they drafted a 50-page filing to two UN Special Rapporteur and the UN, to the UN Special Rapporteur and the UN Working Group and the CERT. The CERT, we received a response that we already have, um, Parliament already has that information. And then, um, three supplemental filings, so two UN recently that we, we sent. So right now, we're do, what we're doing, we're just awaiting the response from those two um, UN groups that we submitted from. The Peter Koharis is not on, 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 um, on, uh, on retainer for the rest of the year. It ended in December. That retainer, that agreement was for the year 2021, the entire year of 2021. And then I think we also had the November and December. So it was for about 14 months. 14? Yes, 14 months. And that's it. Um, then, I don't know what other questions. The agreement, the, the agreement, as I recall, was passed in presidium. We received a, a proposal. 
and then it was passed by proceeding. I recall, remember, remember also uh, some of the members of parliament also meeting with Koharis, giving him an, an introductory meeting as to um, what he will be doing. I remember that in the past, but it was a very um, informal meeting for those that wanted to, to hear from him. And then we um, passed the, the, the proposal, the, his proposal in presidium, and then I, the, pres the then president of parliament signed. As we also recalled, there's also a part in there for reparations, and that is still ongoing, and that's based on um, a success, a succession fee. So, provided he, their, 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 the reparations is um, achieved, there is a percentage of 0.085%, and that's it. And that's the ongoing work that the Quarries Group is doing. Um, I think, I hope that's clear. I don't know if I missed anything, Madam Chair. Maybe the MP Westcott Williams could let me know if I missed anything. Um, MP Westcott, sorry, MP, MP Westcott Williams, is there anything else that you would want, MP? Okay. Gums, go. Okay, MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, the issue of the correspondence um, and... If the, it, sorry for the new question, but if the agreement ended in December, then is there a, are we now paying an hourly fee because they're still monitoring and they're still, like that's still work being done. And I, I don't know any law firm that generous, but yeah, um, if we could just get some clarity on that. Thank you. Thank yes. you, MP Gums, MP Ellicott. Yes, yes. MP, MP Gums, to answer your question, most of the work uh, by the Koharis group is pro bono work. And yes, so we are not paying them anything, as I mentioned before. And regarding the letters, I think there was a little miscommunication. I mentioned the letters that were sent out by the then president of parliament. Those were the, I can, what I can do is in detail, because I don't have it through the top, at the top of my head, but in the letter that I'm going to be sending to MP Westcott, with some of the questions she posed, I can also address in details everything that this um, that that President of Parliament has done pertaining to this motion. I will put that in writing for everyone in detail. But the um, yeah, it has nothing to do with and the, any correspondence right now is merely um, by phone, following up. Um, how is it going with the um, with the with the UN? Uh, Special Rapporteur, any feedback as yet? And and for that, that's it. There's no charge for that at all. MP Gums. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, to be clear, I want to see the correspondence, not just from Parliament to the Koharis Law Group, but between the Koharis Law Group and the United Nations Special Rapporteur. Those are the, the, the course, because I, I've, we've been told that we re, they received responses, that they received more questions, et cetera. So that's basically what I'm asking about. Thank you. Well, definitely, MP comes yes. request would be made that all correspondence be shared with the committee yes. um, accordingly. I'd like to give the floor to MP Bryson and then MP. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to chime in a bit, uh, I guess on, I guess we, we have combined the three agenda points. Uh, that was agreed? Yeah. Okay. Um, First of all, regarding the motion, look, I, I think, uh, especially when this, this was done at the time, it it was uh, mandates the chair of parliament to communicate with any and all third parties on his behalf. Yeah, that's that's pretty broad, you know, if you read the motion. Uh, nonetheless, at the time, what I did try to do is to involve the proceeding as much as possible, especially the fact that um, MP Hela, Grisha Helga Martin was also part of the proceeding. That helped a lot because she was uh, spearheading this. And was able to, you know, kind of guide us as a presidium together on on how we should communicate the engagement with the Koharis group, etc. So it's not just to avoid a, a, an a impression that because number nine says mandate the chair, that everything was just done by the chair on my own or on her own. That's definitely not the case. A lot of this actually has to be done. As a matter of fact, the contracting of any third parties, for example, the law firm for the, the penal code. Uh, the the uh, Hoover Rogers for constitutional matters and so on, all of that is handled within the presidium uh, as a collective. Um, I do think that um, it is helpful kind of in that same mindset uh, that uh, on the communication part with third parties that at the very least the presidium inf inf is informed, maybe even uh, in a faction leaders meeting we can get an update on such communication. That would also help so that that's an easy way to get a hey, By the way, just to update you, since last faction leaders meeting, 
um, I communicated the following. And then we get some points update. I think maybe that's just a slight adjustment I would welcome. Um, especially communication with the other parliaments is especially important for members of parliament because we interact with those parliaments sometimes ourselves. So let's say sometimes if I'm speaking to an MP from Aruba or from Curacao, it's good for me to know that hey, there was some communication received from them from our chair. You know, so that it, it doesn't kind of feel like hey, we, we weren't a part of it. Then actually we can say, yes, we're aware of it. And yeah, I, I think it's good what she did. And I think, you know, so I think that slight adjustment is, is needed going forward. Um, but other than that, I think it's, it's pretty um, clear what the mandate should be and just the communication can improve. We've had some slight hiccups, I would say, with maybe the, the, the amended petition. I think that was clarified. I think going forward, it's clear any sort of future petitions or such will come to this committee. I think that's an agreement we've made. Um, so I welcome seeing that work continue. I, too, would like uh, some sort of update on where we are specifically right now with uh, the special rapporteur's response. Um, what is the latest we've heard from them? Um, I think there was some additional information based on the amended petition that had to go. Um, how soon do we estimate? I know it's very hard to say because the special rapporteurs, uh, people are might not realize they're actually on un unpaid positions, you know, so they don't exactly work there 24 seven, um, but it's nonetheless a very important position. They have a pace at which they work, um, but it would be interesting to see with all of the ongoing debate with COHO if that aspect is uh, we can get some sort of time frame. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. I agree with you that information definitely needs to be shared, uh, shared with members in order for us to be kept abreast of what is what is happening indeed. Uh, MP Helica Martin, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, with, pertaining to the questions posed by MP Bryson, there's two I can answer. One, one sparked. Just, I, just, I was just reminded to um, mention this as well. Some, uh, one of the letters that I, as, as chair, also sent out was the letters to Curacao in Aruba asking to support the, um, support the petition. This was also um, suggested by the special rapporteur. And what I'll do, I'll make sure I'll get the, all that information in writing and um, all of the supported documentation with that. Um, all the supported documentation from the special rapporteur to the Koharis group requesting that. And um, lastly, what the last time we've heard from the Koharis group, the whole back, we were supposed to receive uh, uh, um, recommendations from these both these UN working groups by March. It was supposed to be mid to late March. But with the, U, the Ukraine war, that has... Uh, that has become precedence of the, 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 the two special working, um, special rapporteurs, the working UN working group and the special rapporteur. And that's the reason why we're unable to receive um, um, recommendations because that has taken precedence for them. That has been the setback. But he has also always every two, three weeks follow up with them. And that's the last update I received from the Coharvest group. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP. MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Lady. Madam Chair, Lady, I too look forward to receiving all of the documentation um, regarding this matter, petitions, updates, etc., answers, etc. And Madam Chair, Lady, not to belabor the point, but I think the way that we have gone about entering into this agreement, um, I would like Parliament to kind of look into that so that um, we know it is being done right or not, and how going forward in the future. Madam Chair, Lady, where the parliament itself is concerned, and contract law, um, as it applies to parliament, is a very, very thin line. And as so when I say a thin line, meaning walking, entering into agreements, et cetera, following up on these agreements. And again, I don't want to have a discussion in here yet in terms of, yeah, but uh, you know, no, I don't want to tell you what I think, but I'm just saying that that should be looked into. I do not believe that the way the agreement has been entered into on the basis of a general motion of parliament with the Koharis Law Group was the right way to go about it. Um, making parliament a party to an agreement that could have further reaching consequences. And I would just like that 
to be um, researched and uh, indicated whether yes, no, or whether you can go presidium, get the approval on the basis of a, a, a general motion or not. Again, Madam Chair, Lady, I'm not asking for any um, discussion. I am suggesting to this committee that the way that that was done be looked into and, if necessary, establish how it should be done in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott-Williams. Understood. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Madam Chair, I have a question for the Chair Lady of Parliament. Let's say there was no motion. Let's say there was no motion even empowering to go and find another law firm. Is it not the purview of the Presidium to seek legal advice? Has this not happened in the past, with or without a motion? And doesn't a motion actually strengthen the Presidium's goal to say, hey guys, by the way, there was a motion, let's really look into this and find a law firm that can assist us. I'm saying, let's go. we don't have to go back very far, okay? I, I understand that there might be something looking at this coherence motion like it's out of nowhere, but go back into the records of parliament and you will see we have contracted law firms, we have had, uh, we have had contracts for ICT, we have all kinds of contracts. Yes, I agree it's a very thin line, because if there's a dispute, absolutely, we experienced that. Previous presidiums did, let me not go into too much detail, but had contract signs that ended up in dispute, that we didn't even know how do we manage this dispute for certain equipment and stuff like that. That happened, but you had to find a way and a solution. But it's not to say that because there's a thin line that it just completely strips the presidium of its authority. I'm not saying that's what anyone is saying. I'm just saying this to make sure that that's not the impression that's put out there. The Parliament of St. Martin, yes, does not have um, um, that sort of legal structure like an NV or a government. But the presidium does need to be able to manage and handle these things together with the secretariat that then goes out, gets it, does the negotiation and so on, and the presidium is an overseeing body. All I'm saying is, in my opinion, I'd like to hear the chair, Lady Triman, on this, is that if in addition to that right, there's also a motion of parliament supported by a vast majority saying, hey, go ahead and do this, is that not even a better reason to go ahead and do this? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. I, love, I would allow the chair lady to respond to you. MP? MP Bryson, thank you for your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, through you, Madam Chair, I'd like to respond. I would like to first read the resolution um, tied to this motion that was passed to by between, I think it was 14 members of parliament at that time, and 11 majority decided to um, approve resolves to immediately retain local and international legal counsel to assist the Parliament and Government of St. Martin with the ending of the violation of St. Martin's UN mandated right to a full measure of self-government, completing the decolonization of St. Martin and also islands of the former Netherlands Antilles with the assistance of the United Nations in accordance with the past, present, and future obligations of the Netherlands under international law obtaining reparations from the Netherlands for violation of the international law norms as well at, as its treaty obligation. Resolution 5 is clear, and that's what we've executed. Uh, I, I see, I, I can't, I mean, it's clear. That's what 11 members of parliament requested that parliament uh, execute. Normally, from prior, now I've only been in, 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 in presidium since November, 2020, I think I started being part of Presidium. 20, yes, I think it was November 2020 that I began. And I've sat in a few Presidium meetings where we had tours presented to us. And as a Presidium, we decide which uh, um, legal advice we take. But this is a mandate from Parliament that's telling us to execute this. And this is what we did. Hope it's clear. Thank you, MP Helica Martin. I'd like to give the floor to MP Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the question of, that MP Bryson asked um, to the Chair Lady, that question is just, it's, the answer is in the law. You know, um, there are many ways to interpret the law, but the memorium to lifting on the Constitution is very clear, um, the English version and the Dutch version, um, which basically it's very, very simple. Uiteraard dient de bepaling dat de Staten het gehele volk Sint Maartense Volk vertegenwoordigen niet in privaatrechtelijke zin te worden opgevoed. It's simple. It's, it, that's Dutch. It's very, very simple. Parliament cannot act in the way that Co. Harris chose to act with the petition 
in that sense that they are representing the people of St. Martin and the, country, um, and the Parliament of St. Martin, which is what the first page of the petition said. Nobody said that Parliament cannot get legal advice. That is clear. Parliament can ask for legal advice from any local law firm. What is done with that legal advice? That is where Article 44 of the Constitution comes into play. In this sense, the legal advice was not only sought, the law group that was chosen by Parliament, let's say, or the procedure, however you want to put it, they decided to go and hand a petition in by the UN. And that petition says, a petition that represents the Parliament of St. Martin and the people of St. Martin. And when it said the people of St. Martin, it went directly against the Memorium and Toelichting, the elucidation of our Constitution, Article 44. It's black and white. It is not up for interpretation. And seeking legal advice is not the same as going and handing in a petition by the UN, which is a privaatrechtelijke handeling. That is what it's about. So just to be clear that um, that is not real, a real discussion point, that's just a matter of opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Peterson. MP Halika Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a matter of fact. Uh, uh, resolution 945 is what we use. And as I've stated in this hall of legis legislative hall many, many times before, international law supersedes our law. And this was part of our motion. We used resolution 945 that what Pro Soliga clearly stated, allowing us the opportunity to knock on the door. Now, if these UN bodies found it, if they, they thought that how could Parliament come and knock on our door? If they're the ones that found merit, found it that it was, okay, then you, you have something here. Let's work with you. Because when we submitted it in March 2021, they found it had merit. I stated it right here sitting at this same chair that they had merit and they kept working with us throughout the year. So if, if the UN body then felt that it was not important, that we had no rights, they would have never accepted it. They would have never accepted the petition. So I don't see where we act not in accordance to constitution, but I mean we, we, we executed our rights to invoke resolution 945 and that's what this parliament did. And that's, that's again my, it's a factual opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. MP Peterson, you have the floor. Thank you, MP. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, a matter of opinion remains an opinion, even if it's called factual. So I can go back to the drawing board with this and basically say that the misinterpretation of pro Legal Foundation, back to square one, which is why we did not vote for the motion in the first place, that basically gave this parliament the impression that that is the way to go about it, that was wrong. pro Legal was wrong again in their interpretation of that resolution. So again, I'm not going to, <clears throat> I'm not going to belabor the, the discussion. Um, I think it's pretty clear what the parliament tried to do. And again, how it had to be done is also clear. That's also put in, in, the, in the law. If we as a country want to step to the United Nations, which is our right, and the United Nations has separate bodies for the parliaments of countries to go to them and also for the governments of countries to go to them. We did not choose the right one. That is, that is actually the first fact. Second of all, if the parliament wants to step to the UN, but who bears responsibility for countries in Martin on an international level? That is the Prime Minister of St. Martin. That is the government. So what this parliament had to do is very simple. Government, this is what we want to see championed in regards to decolonization. We are motioning you to execute it, to step to the UN, and please represent us the right way. Not by choosing three members of parliament or through presidium to go to a foreign law firm without informing the rest of parliament, and then only after the fact when the petition has already been filed and money has already been spent, more than 10,000 guilders, of government money has been spent, only then do they come to Parliament to even inform us. Don't pretend as if that is not wrong, because that is the only fact that is here at the table. And that will be all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pearson. MP Westcott-Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. My point was actually the point raised by MP Peterson, even his earlier one. And I just want to add to that, Madam Chair, lady, that a motion of Parliament is exactly that, a motion, an expression, a desire, a stance, et cetera, et cetera. But Madam Chair Lady, because motions can be so um, varied, it due diligence is still required on the basis of 
every motion of parliament, whether it's a unanimous motion, 15 members, 10 members, it still requires that it has to be handled uh, with due diligence and all of the legal connotations need to be taken into account. It is not, we can put it in as often as we want, Madam Chair Lady, but it's not that simple. We can say we mandate in this one, we mandate in the government, we instruct in the government, but even in such a case, Madam Chair Lady, even if we pass a motion instructing the government within 30 days to eliminate um, the, all of the, the, the cost for fuel, Madam Chair Lady, the government can do it. Imagine us mandating ourselves. Due diligence has to be applied regardless to what or how a motion comes about. And Madam Chair Lady, I'll leave it at this until we can really have that discussion going about these matters henceforth. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Do we have any other remarks from the floor? Okay. Um, I will, as uh, mentioned earlier, request that all correspondence, all information with, the, with agreement with Coharis, uh, any other questions from the MPs be shared with this committee. Once all of that information is shared, then of course members can propose on the way forward. Um, yeah. I would like to thank uh, the members of this committee for participation in today's meeting. And I hereby close today's meeting. A good afternoon to everyone. Meeting closed. <laughs>